Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Fenquet debate. Uh, we're taking stock of uh, those 3.4 million people that were in the streets on Sunday. Most of the panelists present included. It's the France Fenquet debate. We're in the company of uh, Arash Derambarch, who's uh, city councilor in the Paris suburb of uh, Courbevoie. And you were saying in for part one of our discussion, friends as well with um, four of those killed. Yes. Not your political cup of tea, Charlie Hebdo. Um, them about them. Charlie Hebdo, uh, what they <coughs> what they wrote was not what you agree. What you what you stand for is at the UMP party. Um, if I was uh, stand up with them. No. If do you agree with their politics? Oh um, no, because because th th there was two voice uh, uh, b between between the the point of view of Charlie Hebdo. On what's happened uh, during these uh, last uh, days, uh, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, if Charlie Hebdo, if the the, uh, the artist of Charlie Hebdo uh, saw what's happened now, I think that they were not very happy uh, to see uh, I am Charlie to the front of the New York Nasdaq. But the surviving uh, Dutch cartoonist Willem said, exactly. I vomit on those exactly, people who claim exactly, to be our friends exactly, all of a sudden. Exactly. Right. But the notion of I am Charlie. Like I saw, I watched it last night with uh, Georges Cluny to the Grammy Awards, is that the freedom of speech, uh, the value. Yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Just, well, let's introduce the rest of our panel here. Justin Smith is with us from the University of Paris. Take out <laughs> Fabrice Appelboin of Sciences Po and France 24's very own uh, Salima Belhaj. Uh, uh, Justin Smith, two points on this. First of all, um, we've heard from survivors from Charlie Hebdo Ambiguous message, like Willem, the, the cartoonist, saying he vomited on it. Uh, but we've also seen some of the staff members take part in those marches. And we've seen as well that the, the, the freedom of speech aspect of Je suis Charlie, they, they approve of. Sure, sure. Well, obviously, there's a, there's a whole mix of emotions and a whole mix of reactions. I quite admired Willem's mm -hmm. reaction, and I think it is more uh, true to the uh, satirical tradition, which is deeply rooted in this country and is now under threat. Um, 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 but in, in addition, I think uh, it's important to recognize uh, that, uh, that it was co-opted very fast uh, for very uh, diverse set of reasons by a number of people who really do not share in the spirit of Charlie Hebdo at all, um, who are its traditional targets and its traditional enemies. And that should make everyone at least a bit uncomfortable. Make them uncomfortable? But should they be heartened, Fabrice Appelboin, by the fact that there were so many people, that this is beyond politicians? Are we talking about the Charlie Hebdo team? Or are we talking about the march on, on Sunday? Well, once again, the march wasn't gather, gathering everybody. And this very slogan, Je suis Charlie, was de facto excluding many people, many people who got deeply hurt by what Charlie was and many people who were hypocritical enough to pretend they weren't. So, of course, there wasn't anything else we could do about it. Uh, the politician didn't invent this slogan. It was uh, created by a guy on the social network, and it got successful at light speed. But definitely, there was a very big problem about union as a nation in this gathering. It was a very heartening moment. We needed to do this as a sort of collective therapy, but we need to see what is not going r right in this country, especially when it comes to uh, this political discourse saying that there is only one nation, one citizenship. It, is, it isn't true. Go to a football match and have a look at the supporters in a football match, and you'll see that many people in this country have two different nationality and recognize themselves yeah. as having two different cultures. Or look at the statistics on the prison population in France, which is grossly disproportionately. Well, Just not. like in the United States. <coughs> sure. The there, there's another disproportion <laughs> there. Yes. All right. There's, there's the issue of that. There's the first issue that was brought up in part one of our discussion, which is the security issue. Uh, already the cabinet is going to review tighter security and surveillance measures at their weekly meeting on Wednesday, where the French um, unwittingly on Sunday also marching for less freedom. After all, uh, that's what followed in the United States after September 11th with the Patriot Act. Nicholas Rushworth takes a look. 
New York 2001, Madrid 2004, London 2005. Three attacks which had a profound impact on security in their respective countries. London already had plenty of CCTV cameras and there were more after the 7-7 attacks, making the British capital the most surveyed city in the world. Body language is our key weapon. If a guy seems agitated, keeps looking around, keeps looking at his watch, maybe makes several phone calls, then we'll actually monitor him. Each of the three countries have adapted police training and beefed up police cooperation with intelligence services. The main change, though, has been in legislation, as, for example, in the UK, where the Terrorism Act was introduced in 2006. It's allowed police to hold suspects for up to 28 days without bringing a charge. The legislation was inspired by the US Patriot Act, signed into law by George W. Bush a few weeks after 9-11. Under the Patriot Act, investigators and anti-terror authorities can detain people for months and listen into conversations between a lawyer and their client. EU-wide attention is focusing now on ways of improving border security at airports. Talks may lead to faster implementation of a single register of information for air passengers leaving or entering most European countries. And the latest on that is this Monday, the uh, British Prime Minister saying that if he's re-elected in the spring, he will call for uh, new laws to uh, tighten surveillance of the internet and mobile phones. Fabrice Appelboin, one of the things you teach is information warfare. You look a lot of, at a lot of these issues in your, in your studies. Um, does France need tougher laws? It already have those tough laws. Uh, real, uh, when we're speaking about the electronic part, we already have a Patriot Act. The only thing missing is uh, things that have absolutely nothing to do with electronic surveillance, like detaining someone without asking anybody for uh, any amount of time. We don't have this in France. Uh, the only thing missing in the electronic part is considering hackers as terrorists. So far, we don't have this yet. But when it comes to global surveillance, we have roughly the same laws. It has been voted last year by everybody in the Socialist Party. So we have those law. So some are saying there were lapses, and they're not so much due to the laws, but to the fact that there wasn't the manpower to you know, keep there their eyes on the probably wasn't enough manpower to have that many people under surveillance. There probably isn't enough manpower, if, even if we had the money to hire them, which we have, there isn't any, uh, enough people to surveil as many people as we have, because there are lots of people who could become terrorists tomorrow, and there probably are lots of people who could tomorrow commit, commit an act of terrorism. All right, lots of reactions, by the way, uh, coming in on Facebook. Haval uh, saying, unfortunately, most of the presidents of other countries who participated in the rally uh, do not let their people rally in their own countries. So that's uh, one remark that was uh, th that was made. Uh, um, Arash de Rambarash, you were talking about one how uh, there should be uh, tougher laws, but what should be tougher? Fabrice Appelboin says it's all there already. Oh, um, what said uh, Fabrice is true. Uh, the first thing that we have to say uh, uh, every thing here is that. It's not a question to uh, say that freedom of speech and her value uh, could be uh, delayed <clears throat> because of the uh, situation. Now, we have not to panic. Uh, we have to meditate and to d uh, debate about what is the situation now and what we want to do just after, because we have to think ab about after, to tomorrow. And, and do, you, do you think that it's okay to give up a little bit of freedom in exchange for safety? We have, we have got all the bills. We have got all the law about that today. But in France, I want to say the truth. Uh, the, the Ministry of the Justice in France is hide. I uh, didn't see her during the four days uh, past. Only maybe with uh, Christian Amampo in CNN, in another channel. But sh she didn't talk with French people, first of all. The second thing is that we haven't got lots of uh, judge uh, when the policeman arrested somebody, he, they came it. They gave they gave it to. Uh, right, so the justice the, the system just, needs more manpower. Is in, what you're saying? In France, this is. We we <clears throat> if we for example put to trial 
every single French citizen who tweeted something praising those uh, terror attacks. And yes. there were two, by the way, there have been two arrests, one in the city yeah, of Strasbourg one. and one in the city exactly. of Nice. Now, there have exactly. been 35,000 who tweeted that. something like serious. that. We need to put into oh. prison 35,000 people. To How radicalize on earth them in are turn. we going, not to Fabrice mention that they serious. would be radicalized in prison? How can we decently manage to get in prison 35,000 people. One of the two brothers people. came to the jail. It's a question. I'm not saying uh, we and, shouldn't and do And that brings us to I'm, another I'm point. Asking to Yemen, Fabrice, on earth, was to this Yemen. is something we to trial 35,000 people. It was people. to Yemen. Here's something, here's something that a lot of foreigners don't understand. In France, there is no law against blasphemy, but um, you can be sent to jail for, for saying offhanded remarks like... Um, 100% with those two brothers, One person, the person in Nice who was arrested uh, for saying that. Justin Smith, um, on his Facebook page, the controversial satirist Dieudonné, yes. uh, writing, Je suis Charlie Koulibaly. I am Charlie Koulibaly. Amidi Koulibaly was the killer in the grocery store, the kosher grocery store. Should you be going to jail for that? Well, two points. I, I'm on record as saying, uh, coming from my uh, 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 general uh, American commitment to the First Amendment, I'm on record as saying that I think the bar is far too low for what counts as uh, incitement to racial hatred in France. I think that the more uh, permissive uh, speech codes are, the harder it is for hate speech to g gain real-world traction. So uh, my line on Dieudonné would be, let him say whatever he wants, keep him marginal. Um, now, the fact that he said, je suis Charlie uh, 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 I think shows very clearly that there is a sort of bizarre collusion between uh, the far right and uh, and and the fundamentalist uh, Islamists in France. They're working together, whether they know it or not. They're working together, sure they um, and um, and it's very much to Marine Le Pen's advantage. Salima Belhaj. Yeah, I just wanted to say something to link about the the lack of justice. You said. Mm -hmm. I think also that the French authorities has to have a look at the own organization that they have created, like what's, what we call in France uh, le Centre um, Conseil Français du Culte Musulman, mm -hmm. the, the, the Council for French uh, Muslim yeah, Because there is no nationwide, or, there wasn't a nationwide organization for imams. And exactly. So and it was the state that organized one. And it has been created to control the imam, to control uh, that there is no fundamental fundamentalism imam in the mosque. And when the attack happened, is happening. We are thinking that, yes, they went to a mosque, what we call La Filière de Butte Chaumont, in Paris, in the quarter of Stalingrad, when there is fun fundamentalist imam. Yeah, it was so, way, it was a decade ago. Yeah, and there was also imam who has been arrested before because they were saying that a woman has been beaten up and they have been sacked from France because it was not, uh, it it has not been approved by France. So if French authorities have created those kind of council, they have to uh, maybe reinforce the power of this council or to delete the council and create something else that can really control what is said in those mosques. But I th it's complicated. I, 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 the Muslim religion is based on a network, just like Protestant. Uh, Having control of a network is not possible. It's like saying to the protestant, hey, I'm going to give you a pope. It will not work. It's mm -hmm. not working like that. Uh, protestants and Muslim do not organize their religion this way. Trying to have them organize it this way cannot work. It's a major no, problem. No, but you can also know in which mosque yeah, of the imam are forcing the young Absolutely. We know, guys. I, I, we probably that know that. So we know where those, Isla those imam are. But putting someone and saying, hey, now he's the leader of the Muslim community because, yeah, well, basically the French president decided so, is not going to work. He will never be recognized as the leader of the Muslim community. It doesn't work like this. Islam doesn't work like no, this. No, no, I'm not saying about creating a leader because actually there is this one kind of leader called Dalit Boubaker, who is the president of the Muslim Council in France. And the only thing that he's doing is uh, just writing the first day of Ramadan and the last day of Ramadan. Yeah. But if France is asking those authorities to talk to the Muslim community, because it's like, you're Muslim, talk to the Muslim, they have to do more. 
Mm. And they have to do to prevent those. And, and it gets uh, it gets us back to the conversation yeah. of. You, you, this is not the good problem. The good problem, the really problem, is that France is like. Is a secular. The meaning, the the meaning of that is that, uh, it's not the role of the state, to to uh, to organize it. But they did it. No. They, did they, it. they created the, the French Muslim Council. I, it's not my care. I don't say mm. that. What is the theory mm. of uh, the uh, the law in France? Since nine, 1905, mm. okay, um, we have got an organization. The problem of France and the politic, uh, the French politics is that to say we have got all the rights in our country, but you have got obligation. This is the truth. And today, um, a few communities like Muslim persons, people, think that in France they haven't got um, lots of rights. We have to say again that all the person in France have got rights. We have to talk with each other to say what is our country, what is the education of our country. Um, I, propose, it, it, I propose one thing, to debate uh, after what's happened last week, to debate during one year, all the French people about what's happened to our country and what, what is the uh, value that uh, we have got each other Okay, to make a better country. Arash de Rambach, you may be from the UMP party, but one man who agrees with you is from the Socialist Party. He's the French foreign minister. Laurent Fabius saying the answer for France is its model of laïcité, its secular model. I think we need to teach secularism in our schools again. In France, we have something extremely valuable. That's to say, the separation of religious life. Everyone can practice their religion in the private domain, or not. But the only real common community we have is French citizenship. Teaching secularism in junior high schools. Uh, and by the way, Justin Smith, we saw there was a few articles published about what some of the kids said uh, last week. They didn't. Some in the in working class. Uh, neighborhoods didn't want to do the minute of silence uh, or one even asking a 14 year old huh? asking uh, why didn't the jihadists simply kill the editor and spare the others sure well I mean the problem with just uh, uh, buckling down or digging in your heels and insisting on secularism as an absolute uh, ideal of the French Republic, it's almost as if what you're saying is that it's all up to you, 14-year-old kid in the banlieue, um, um, to, uh, to, to recognize this and to live up to the model that we're providing. But if that doesn't happen, the question is, what do we do then? And evidently, it is failing. And it's failing because there is such an intractable uh, uh, position that, 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 that French officials are taking up. And, Laurent and Fabius, long time. Laurent Fabius, who we heard, he's a politician based in, in your hometown of Rouen. Uh, in the working class projects in Rouen, uh, do people think that secularism is a treasure? They do believe in secularism, and we have been taught secularism in school. But the thing is that uh, for the the Muslim community itself, because it's a Muslim community that has been poisoned by the secularism, it's like secularism is force Muslim to hide themselves. Mm -hmm. Because most of them think that those secular law, like uh, banning the hijab or banning uh, a mother to go on the field strip to school with her child, is against Islam. So that's why those young boy who didn't want to do the minute, the minute of, sil of silence, who didn't want to march, they are thinking any time that we pronounce the word secular, it's against Islam. Mm -hmm. So we have to educate them, saying that it's two different things, that mm -hmm. yes, you have the right to be a French Muslim, respecting secularism, it's uh, something that you can do. But because any time authorities are talking about secularism, they are talking also about something that will go against the Muslim community, it's hard to understand for them. These are high ideals, though. These are abstract <clears throat> concepts. And if a 14-year-old kid is not grasping them, it's pretty hard to point the finger at the community that 14-year-old kid comes and, from. And Justin Smith, one final question. Um, this post uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre moment in France.
how different is it from post 9-11? Well, uh, I actually think things are uh, accelerated in a in a kind of surprising way. And I've mentioned this before. I think the 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 feeling of truly human solidarity uh, uh, lasted at least a month in the United States, or at least in New York, before uh, the opportunistic politicians uh, moved in and made us think this is something very different. The spirit of this is changing. And so I'm actually rather surprised at how fast it's being co-opted. You think it's already being co-opted? Oh dear, that's a that's a that's a debate for 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 tomorrow. Maybe come back tomorrow. <laughs> Justin Smith, I want to thank you. Fabrice Pelboin, Salima Belhaj. I also want to thank Arash Terambarch for being with us. Stay with us because it's now time for our Media Watch segment. And uh, we can say hello now to James Creighton. Good evening, Francois. Um, so trying to sum up in five minutes what has been such an enormous story uh, since last Wednesday and certainly since yesterday in terms of how it's uh, been, how it's played out across social media and across the world's media. First of all, the hashtag Je suis Charlie, which sort of seemed to spontaneously crop up uh, last Wednesday, shortly after the attack at Charlie Hebdo. It became one of the most popular hashtags in uh, Twitter history. Uh, at one point, a rate of six thousand five hundred uh, times a minute it was being used at its height um, it just became an absolute phenomenon and that it's is just the, that's just the French version no I think it's still very much active and that's only the French version it was also translated into other languages so if you add all that together it's uh, it, it's huge it was initially um, tweeted by a journalist who goes under the uh, the handle at Joaquim uh, for a, a French regional newspaper and he actually also did this avatar uh, this image he edited together himself and that went completely viral indeed. You can see it all over our newsroom, for example. It was uh, used as a very visible sign of support uh, for uh, the newspaper. Now, that in itself, uh, in the days after the Charlie Hebdo attack, it provoked a certain amount of discussion, a certain amount of debate. We saw articles such as this one in Slate and across the French press too. Yes, uh, they were heroic. Yes, they defended uh, freedom of expression. But the content on occasion, according to some, was was racist, that point of view was being put out there, which led some people to say, je ne suis pas Charlie, I am not Charlie. Now that controversy, I, I did see a lot and of believe discussion. me, I'm as sad as you, it says. Exactly, exactly. In other words, I also support freedom of expression, but I'm not sure I necessarily support the editorial line of Charlie Hebdo. So that was also a sort of a side debate, if you like. Now it didn't stop people taking to the streets, as we saw yesterday, in unprecedented numbers. I mean, the estimations are 1.5 million or more. Indeed, the Interior Ministry could no longer uh, even try to hesitate or to, to, to guess how many people were on the streets. And it led to just extraordinary images, that one by Reuters, but a lot of people taking uh, images on their smartphones and on various, putting them up on social media. It was uh, extraordinarily visual. And then, of course, François Hollande, it really was something where he was, uh, I suppose, at the centre of uh, the global media attention and indeed there were images such as this one which certainly flatter the French president and a lot of people saying that he may indeed benefit from this even though that's of course not the it shouldn't be the central focus but there were images such as this with uh, Patrick Pellou uh, one of the journalists from Charlie Hebdo a very emotional moment and even a side story there that somehow he may even managed to get some smiles and laughter I'm not sure if you've seen this Francois but apparently a pigeon at that exact moment um, pooped on his shoulder and... Uh, on the president's on shoulder. On the president's shoulder, which led, as you can see, the journalists there, uh, they were actually the other journalists, despite the emotion of the moment, were dying laughing, right? Mm -hmm. So we may see uh, an echo of that in next Wednesday's, uh, next Wednesday's edition of Charlie Hebdo. So um, if it, uh, if it, Hollande came out of it looking quite positively, and Nicolas Sarkozy apparently tried to get frontline attention in that uh, head of state... Uh, Line up there. You can see he's trying to sneak forward um, in between Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Cato, I believe, which um, gave rise to a blog, a Tumblr blog, oh, Je suis yeah. Nico, where basically he's appearing pretty much everywhere, Francois. So, and even in his own photo opportunities. So that's quite, I mean, it did get some people laughing uh, despite it all. But I suppose uh, there's a serious side to it too, in the sense that uh, uh, some cartoonists from Charlie Hebdo were worried about the, the event becoming too political political, in fact, and something that had been initially suggested by associations. There was a fear, even by Charlie Hebdo journalists, that it would become something uh, overly political too early on, and even Reporters Without Borders, borders the Paris-based NGO, said, hold on a minute, some of these heads of state aren't exactly 
paragons or huge examples of press freedom internationally. There was one Twitter user who pointed out that the Foreign Minister of Bahrain was present uh, with the second biggest which is the record for the second biggest jailing of journalists mm. in the world. So there were all these contradictions, but mm. I think it didn't stop the event from really uh, being one that was hugely positive and uniting. There were uh, there were pieces of journalism like this by Antoine de Cohn of uh, Le Grand Journal on Canal+, Plus, who said, you know, the, the reason everybody got down on the street was it wasn't just Je suis Charlie, which not necessarily everybody can get behind. It was Je suis Juif, I'm Jewish, I'm, I'm a policeman, I'm a Muslim. It really gathered people together behind many different banners uh, in a very, um, I think, moving way. The next hashtag to look out for uh, François, on fait quoi maintenant? It was France Info put that up today. What are we going to do now after the unity of yesterday? I think some are asking those questions. All right, we will leave it there. And it's a question we've, of course, been broaching. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you, James. And thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. All right, please remain seated because we're still on.